Thanks, uh, Professor. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, staying. And uh, I would also like to thank, uh, before I forget, the organizers for the uh, opportunity uh, and for the invitation and this opportunity. I, I appreciate it very much. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about how we can use equations of fluid dynamics for image in painting. So the earlier uh, lectures are essentially making analogies for you know different dynamics, and so this is kind of a, along the same lines. Okay, so the first part, uh, I would like to introduce a particular type of turbulence modeling. And then um, the second part, I will go over in painting, image in painting basics. And then the third part is essentially um, testing the validity, validity of this model in terms of um, uh, image in painting. So we can kind of um, uh, see or test whether we're getting nice in painting depending on which turbulence model we use. All right, so I'll start with the Navier-Stokes equations. No explanation is needed, but I essentially I just need to introduce some notations. Here, when theta is one, we have the usual Navier-Stokes equations. And if I put uh, some uh, regularization operator, let's say M, and depending on the power, I will essentially get different types of turbulence models. All right? Then if uh, we consider a particular type of equations and we vary the power of um, theta, uh, sorry, the value of theta and theta 2, then this is uh, studied by Olson and Titi in 2007 where Essentially, they uh, derive sufficient conditions on the relationship between theta and theta 2 to establish global well posedness and re global regularity of solution. So essentially, this is like NS, Navier-Stokes alpha model, where you, they interpolate between having this to uh, be bigger than 1, in which case you have like hyper-viscous model, versus modifying the nonlinearity and smoothing the, for example, the uh, velocity field advecting the, uh, the rough velocity field. And uh, motivated by this, we can still generalize the equations in which the operator A here is not necessarily the Laplacian. And also, we don't necessarily have now the same smoothing uh, degree between the <coughs> advecting velocity field and the advected velocity field. And this term really normally gets absorbed into the pressure when you have some nice symmetries. And the chi is just uh, either zero or one. The reason we did this is because there are families of alpha models that is embedded in these equations. The global regularity property has been developed. And so we generalized it to see if we can recover those results. And in fact, we do recover those results plus more. And again, some examples of the operator A is the usual uh, Laplacian operator and the usual Hemholtz uh, operator for M and N. And there's a summary. This is, uh, again, as I've said, these are the type of alpha modelings that, that we have so far. This is the usual Navier-Stokes, and this is the operator that you, you give to this equation. Uh, the Leray alpha constitutes this particular type of operator, ML alpha, or modified Leray alpha, <coughs> simplified Bardina model, Navier-Stokes Voigt, Navier-Stokes alpha equation, and this is the um, Navier-Stokes alpha-like equations, which is the model that was introduced by Olson and TT. So, as I've said, uh, we have uh, generalized the result of Olson and TT and we also found necessary and sufficient conditions for the ranges now of the three parameters uh, for dissipation and smoothing in order to obtain global well posedness results. And so in the context of turbulence modeling, uh, I would like to start again with the Navier-Stokes equation. We know we cannot solve this analytically, 
um, uh, for general uh, physical problems. And so we try to do direct numerical simulations. Uh, even here, we uh, encounter a setback because of the wide range of scales of motion that we need to resolve. We need our mesh to be big enough to capture the large scale, the large scale, uh, large scales, and it needs to be fine enough to capture the Kolmogorov uh, scales of motion, up to the Kolmogorov scales of motion. So. We settle for averages, and the idea is we decompose the velocity into its mean and fluctuating parts. We plug it into the Navier-Stokes equation, and then we average it. Uh, I'm doing long-time averaging. We, call, uh, we get the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations uh, as follows. Again, we still encounter another setback because now we encounter what we call the closure problem, in which the equation now involves the, this term about the uh, fluctuation. And so we need to generate uh, equations for that. We don't want to do this, so this is a fundamental problem in turbulence. We have more unknowns than the number of equations, so we would like to essentially write this in terms of V bar. And if we would like to interpret this in a more physical uh, manner, we can say that turbulence modeling is essentially um, answering the question how we can capture the phenomena of turbulence without having to resolve up to the Kolmogorov length scale. Essentially, we would like to just model, accurately model the net effect of the small subgrid scales onto the large grid scales. So here is one type of turbulence modeling, and I'll tell you in a second how it does it ex exactly in terms of the Reynolds average number Stokes. Uh, let's review. The V here would be like the original velocity in Navier-Stokes. Here's a nonlinear term. The U is a smoother velocity field, and this will make the nonlinearity milder. This is an extra nonlinear term that normally gets absorbed to the pressure when you have some nice symmetry. And we can interpret here alpha as a filter width, if we want to think of it as a turbulence model. And we can think of it as the smallest eddy scale, which is still actively participating. This is your filter width. This is the, your mesh. Anything below that is modeled. This is um, called also Lagrangian average of your Stokes alpha model, or also called viscous Kamasa home equations. And when alpha goes to zero, we recover the Navier Stokes equation. The invisible equation of this is first derived by Home Mars and Ratiu and in 1998, and uh, here, when the uh, viscosity is zero, you do not have global well positives. So then, how can we say that the Navier-Stokes alpha is as a closure model? So we take, again, the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, and then I look at steady state solution of the Navier-Stokes alpha. I can rewrite it as follows. And in this, uh, uh, by ejection, we can see that the filtered velocity field U, the smooth velocity field in the alpha model, acts like the mean flow in the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes. And to test the validity of this ansatz, uh, Chen et al. in 1998 found the explicit solution to the Navier-Stokes alpha model in the symmetry of channel and pipe, and they compared it to the experimental data in the channel way in Wilmart and also numerical data for higher Reynolds number of Moser, Mo, and Kim, and uh, of the Zagarola experimental data in the super pipe, and there is an excellent match with that. So as a, as a, as a closure model, it's doing well. So as a summary, we have global well posting as a result for 3D Navier-Stokes alpha model, which is approximating the Navier-Stokes, and there exists a finite dimensional attractor, which is essentially consistent to what we would expect for the Navier-Stokes equation, that the number of degrees of freedom depends on the bigger, the size of the domain divided by the Kolmogorov length scale to the cube. And there's a prefactor which blows up as alpha goes to zero. So then um, the other alpha model that I've mentioned before uh, behaves similarly. It also um, uh, has a good experimental match, uh, has a good match with experimental data, but I would like to focus with this particular one. This is very special. It's called the simplified Bardina model. 
And let me tell you why. So notice, remember that U is the smoother velocity field and V is the rough velocity field. If I, sorry, if I send the viscosity to zero, if I make the viscosity zero, then I still have global well Poisson as results. In particular, this is what I would get. But notice that this model have the same steady state solution as the Euler, 3D Euler, and also it is a globally well post mo model which is um, uh, approximating 3D Euler without adding viscosity. Okay. And uh, motivated by that, you add a viscous term, then this is a model that's for sure globally well post. And it turns out that this model is consistent uh, with a model for viscoelastic fluids known as uh, Kelvin Voigt model. And in this uh, case, the alpha represents or characterizes the elasticity of the fluid. So we also have some, uh, in the case of 2D Navier-Saul alpha, you can also look at the energy spectrum and you can analyze the behavior or the change of the power laws when you plug in alpha, but that's a different uh, story. Okay, so now this is the second part of the talk where um, I have a couple of references uh, that gives a nice overview and recent advances of, of uh, image in painting procedures using PDEs. Uh, number one is uh, from IEEE and it just recently uh, came out by uh, these authors. And the second one is, uh, this is available online, is a, it's just a, a presentation that I found uh, by um, Carola Viviana Schoenbeer. So what is image in painting? It's a process uh, to correct damaged image by essentially uh, propagating um, data from the boundary. And uh, most of us probably have tried this by blowing up the picture and then looking at every pixels and then copying the pixels around the area. I, I've done it, it's very tedious. So another application, sometimes when we are taking videos and we want to transmit it, the one we have on our camera is highly resolved. And when we transmit it, you lose some data. Again, you don't want to fix that by hand. So this is uh, another application of automation of image in painting. So again, the idea is to fill the damaged part using information from the surrounding area, but we want to do this using the computers. Okay, so the first, I'm gonna give uh, three categories, simple categories. Uh, the first category is what we call diffusion-based in painting. These are PDE models that propagate the local structures from the exterior to interior, interior hole. Uh, we have many variants of this. We can have linear PDEs, we can have nonlinear PDEs, we can have uh, isotropic or versus anisotropic uh, diffusion. And uh, we can also look at um, anisotropic in a sense that you favor a partic uh, particular direction. This is well suited for in painting small regions like thin domains, um, but it is not quite well suited for recovering texture for large areas uh, because you know you see they tend to blur the image. Okay, so. so then there goes the second category of in painting methods, which is called exemplar based, and the goal is to produce an image which is essentially larger than the sample image. But you see, we can't just attach, right? We will see essentially the merge. So the idea is uh, you want to, to synthesize, uh, sorry, uh, you want the texture to be synthesized from a similar region, and then you stitch it together in a certain way um, as patches, or this is, is called exemplar, patches are called exemplar. And this is better suited f uh, than diffusion method for filling large textured areas. Um, however, 
it doesn't, uh, it's not quite uh, well suited for preserving edges. So you can see the third category will be a hybrid of that. Okay, so what they do is they separate the structure and the texture, they fix it using two different methods, and then they merge the results together. And so here is, uh, for example, results using um, diffusion technique, and this is the one that's using exemplar method. And at some point, it's, it's really very hard to detect, so I'm gonna show you a way to quantify uh, the, the um, what do you call this? Uh, to quantify how good in painting is without just using the eyeball norm, okay? And here I'm gonna focus now on PDE-based methods. And the two main steps is you want to retrieve the local image geometry by computing the gray level lines, also called isophotes. And, the, and then you use PDEs to evolve these image structures. All right, so some uh, image in painting basics. Imagine this is our picture, M by N matrix, we have these pixels. Uh, we can have intensity 0 to 255, 0, no intensity, 255, white, high intensity. And we just uh, divide it by 255. So we get numbers between 0 and 1. So for example, the white one right here corresponds to some value closer to 1. And the dark one right here corresponds to a value very close to 0. Isophotes are lines of constant intensity within an image. And uh, recall, the gradient vector tells us the highest increase. So if we want constant, we just rotate it 90 degrees. And uh, let's let now omega be a subset of the domain D. This is domain D, this is the omega. We would like to find a solution I star, such that I star is the same here. Uh, but then I stars, uh, I, I, I star, um, appears to have suitable values for the pixels inside omega. And the method again is we would like to move the image intensity along isophote lines. So here is the mathematics. First, uh, let's recall that nabla perp i will give us the direction of the isophotes. And then in image in painting, we can represent the smoothness of the image as Laplacian I. So what we want now is exactly this quantity. We want the isophote lines, direction, should be almost parallel to the level curves of the smoothness, uh, nabla, sorry, Laplacian I of the image intensity. And so the Algorithm proposed by Bartolomeo, Sapiro, and Ballester, Casales in 2000 is the following. You know, we want to evolve this uh, equation and the steady state solution will capture what we want. So when this is zero, they add this uh, extra term to um, stabilize the numerical uh, simulation. Now this term could be written like this where the G is for essentially anisotropic diffusion if they want the diffusion only in, uh, um, in, in places where you don't have edges. All right, so here's the analogy uh, uh, with the 2D incompressible fluids. Here's the vorticity stream formulation for 2D Navier-Stokes equation. And here we can write the velocity field as nabla per psi, where psi is the stream function. Omega is the curl of u. And therefore, I can write this uh, nonlinear term as nabla per psi dot grad Laplacian psi. And remember, this is what we want in the context of image in painting, and therefore, we can think of the image intensity as a stream function in the 2D vorticity formulation of, of incompressible fluids. So then, this is the elegant analogy first uh, discovered by Bertozzi, uh, Sapiro, and Bartalmio in 2000, 2001. Um, so then, this is good. However, uh, the difficulties which arise in computational fluid dynamics are also inherited. 
So then uh, I said uh, I would like to try uh, the validity of the subgrid scale turbulence models, the alpha models, in the context of imaging painting. So I look at, uh, so we look at the 2D Navier-Stokes void with diffusion. This is work with um, Ebrahimi Holst in uh, 2010. And, uh, and again, uh, this term, we were also putting some anisotropic diffusion, but for simplicity, I just put it like this. And um, we look at some simple results and this is, for example, Navier-Stokes equation with some delta t big enough. It won't converge. So this is the original prob uh, equation, sorry, original image with noise. You run Navier-Stokes equation, but if delta t is big, you recover um, bad. So black just means the, the uh, simulation just quit on you. Uh, then I, we plug in, uh, we, we turn on alpha and we get something nice. Of course, we say, well, what about if we reduce the time, the delta t? We also have uh, Navier-Stokes equations that also converge. And the question is, which one is better and which one is more efficient? So we do a uh, simple test like that. Again, at some point, I had to keep blowing up the um, uh, pictures and see which one is better. So I was just using eyeball norm. And uh, so I said, let me see what they're doing. And this is essentially how we can measure um, uh, the quality of the image in painting. This is a peak signal to noise ratio. And the idea is I know the original picture. That's why it works. If you don't know the original picture, you will have nothing to compare. Uh, here, if I let P to be the original image, uh, a matrix that has the, uh, you know, the values for the intensity of the pixels. I is a reconstructed image. And if I take uh, the uh, Euclidean norm, this is what we call the root mean squared uh, uh, error. And you see if it is big, if it is big, then this is small. But if this is small, the difference is small, then you have a high PSNR. So in other words, big PSNR means better quality reconstruction and low PSNR means not so good of a reconstruction. So then uh, I look at this, I fix delta T for these uh, models, Navier-Stokes, viscosity is fixed. I run it for different values of alpha model and we see that there exists an alpha, namely one third, such that the PSNR is much bigger than the PSNR for Navier-Stokes. And, um, you know, this is big enough that you can detect it with your eyes. If the difference is between half of a PSNR, then, you know, the MPEG commission says you can't uh, really see it, and I can't see it either. So if it's at least one PSNR uh, decibel difference, the, I'm sorry, then, um, um, you know, in some sense you will find difference when you use your eyeball norm. And uh, of course, if I decrease my uh, uh, delta T, again, the Navier-Stokes wins, but within half the PSNR. And so the question is, okay, what is more efficient, what's not? Um, this is essentially the goal of, of this uh, exercise. And um, in terms of uniqueness of steady state solution to this problem, one can really find the right viscosity, <coughs> how big of a viscosity you need in order to get uniqueness of steady state solution. Uh, remember that the bigger the viscosity, the more blurring you get. So we really want a very small viscosity when we're doing and iterating uh, these equations. However, when viscosity is small, the numerical simulation does not converge. So we have to do something else. And so Edris visited uh, one day at UCSD and he said, let's uh, um, reduce the amount of viscosity in the simulation by putting damping. Okay? And so I we did some numerical simulations. Uh, this is again um, telling you that now you require weaker condition on the viscosity in order to get steady state solution. And also 
to modify that, we can also put nonlinear damping. So this is more like adaptive now. This is big whenever this is big, and this is this is uh, quantity is small when this is small. Remember that u is nabla perp of the intensity. And so these are um, the results that we have for the linear damping. I start with the Navier-Stokes uh, parameters in which it doesn't converge. You see that the PSNR just uh, goes down because it's not uh, resolved. And then uh, for, that, the same, for the same viscosity, I turn on the damping term, gamma equals to one, and I get a reasonable uh, picture with a reasonable PSNR. And as I increase my gamma, I get um, uh, less and less PSNR. So I have to choose the right gamma in order to get uh, the best picture, essentially. You want it small enough so that the numerical simulation converge, but not too big that it will essentially kill the, the dynamics. So for the nonlinear, so this is essentially at 46, we found that when we use the nonlinear uh, damping, we get better results. So for example, again, I start with the Navier-Stokes, which is not resolved. I turn on the nonlinear damping. I, oh, I turn off the linear damping. I turn on now the nonlinear damping, and again, I increase in a certain manner. And I found uh, that it will converge with a much better PSNR than the linear damping, because in some sense, the nonlinear damping is adaptive. Um, of course, the, the trend is not quite, uh, you know, decreasing like that. But nevertheless, um, we can find, the punchline is that we can find a parameter uh, such that the um, PSNR is uh, at a maximum. So, as I've said, the nonlinear damping gives much better results in terms of PSNR. Uh, with a difference of uh, two decibels. Both models satisfy maximum principles, so that's nice. And so for challenges in future work, um, I uh, asked some students to essentially automate this uh, if you have multi-region defects so that you don't have to select it manually. So we have some work on that. And also the parameter uh, is essentially finding the right parameter to give the best PSNR. That's also kind of a big problem. And um, um, we also would like to try and do hybrid methods. Um, I have some colleagues at UCNA that does edge preservation. And so a lot of the problems with PDEs is you need diffusion, but diffusion is uh, bad with edges. So I'm gonna tr we're gonna try and combine those two techniques in order to, to get uh, better results. So again, I'd like to thank you for your time. Many thanks again for the organizers for the opportunity.